Good. You're good to go, Emil. All right. Thank you, Magnus. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll sneak back behind to back your cameras yes. are over there. Yes. Okay. I'm Emil. I'm um, currently a senior software engineer at Amazon Web Services, although I'm here tonight speaking on my own behalf with all of the usual disclaimers that goes with that. Today I'm going to draw on this old metaphor, which most of you have probably heard of. Give a boy a small hammer. <laughs> Give a small boy a hammer and he will find everything he encounters needs a pounding. This is apparently the original form of the coat. Due to a man called uh, Abraham Kaplan who said this, or wrote this perhaps in uh, 1964. A few years later, another Abraham rephrased it as the more commonly coated variant. If all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And we can, of course, imagine that we can modernize this further, like give a programmer a screwdriver and he will screw everything up. Or perhaps uh, this relatable formulation. Give a, give a grown man a compiler and he will find that everything he encounters needs a good pounding. So why am I even talking about this? I firmly believe that certain ideas are good enough that they can be used successfully time and again. These are rare and far between, but I will argue that immutability is um, one of them. It's our metaphorical hammer that actually turns everything into a nail. I will attempt to do this by telling you three stories about different hobby projects that I've done over the years. They are, in my opinion, good examples of why immutability is so powerful in practice. And I find them to be reasonably representative of uh, actual things I've encountered over my professional career. First, let's talk about the IRC server. The background for this project was that I wanted to do something more complex in Haskell. Over the years, I've come back to Haskell multiple times and done things like an advent of code or project Euler. But the problem with that sort of toy exercise type problem is that it never really got me to dive into the things that are actually fundamentally different about a pure functional language like Haskell, like um, side effects and um, um, other considerations. So I decided when I came back to this uh, the other year that I needed to dive deeper and in order to do that I had to pick a good project. Decades ago I used to love IRC. In the past I've written several bots, several clients, at least one server. So I kind of knew the project really well from that past life. And um, as uh, protocols go, IRC is a uh, pretty nice one. It um, has a straightforward ASCII representation that is easy to part. The spec is admittedly long, but uh, you can get away with only implementing a small part of it in, in most situations. So it was kind of just right for uh, this because ultimately IRC is uh, by its nature a highly stateful um, pro uh, protocol with uh, plenty of side effects. From reading um, uh, about this every now and then I had heard of this concept of uh, the state monad so I figured as I first started looking at this that that sounds like something that I'm going to need for, uh, for managing the state in this application. And that turned out to be completely wrong. 
once I got started, I quickly realized that there is a much easier and arguably much more standard way to approach this. I will walk you through some bits and pieces of um, how I ended up structuring the server. The first snippet just shows you the main function of the program. It creates a new channel I will use to pass around events, initializes the server state, in this case, just a map of users and a map of channels, and kicks off a new green thread for processing events. The event thread will read events from the bus and update the state, and then we start the main loop. The main loop here is really simple. We wait for a new connection, spawn a thread per client, and then we recurse and do it again. The client handler starts out by creating a new channel that will deal for things that are heading specifically to this client. And then we wait for a user to identify themselves. This yields a user structure that contains things like the nickname of the user, but notably also the the right handle of the channel that we just created. Finally, we pass that new user off to the event thread wrapped up in this uh, new user variant. The per, per user thread will keep running until the client disconnects, reading messages from the event thread and writing them to the socket. And Conversely, parsing messages from the client and then passing that over to the event thread. This may be hard to follow from that description, so I draw you a picture. So when there are no connections, there are just two threads. The main thread that waits for new connections, and then the event thread, which waits for something to happen. When a new connection is established, a new thread is spawned for that client. It waits for the user to identify itself, creates a new channel for the user, constructs the user object, and then passes that over to the event thread, which will update the state and specifically insert the user into the map that stores the connected users. It then spawns a writer thread that reads the per user handle. So now when something happens on the event thread that it wants to pass to a specific user, it can send on that handle and this will take care of actually writing it back over a network to, the, to the, that particular user. So whenever something happens for any client, that all gets passed to the event thread. If state changes, the changes are applied to these maps, and if the user should be, uh, should be notified about something, we can pass it this way, as I described. So let's look at the actual event thread. It reads events of the channel, updates our channel map and user map, processes math messages if relevant, and then turns it back on itself using tail recursion. I use update somewhat sloppily here because we're not actually updating anything in, in place. And this is Haskell and we're dealing with immutable data structures. So what we're really doing is that we're cutting off the branches of the existing trees that are still relevant to us, um, substituting them onto a new tree and uh, returning that back. So let's dwell on this for a second, because from an imperative perspective, this is really weird. We're not actually storing the state anywhere. We're just applying the changes 
and calling ourselves again. It's essentially juggling state rather than storing it, since it's always in motion. So this sort of architecture is really widespread in network applications in, in general, irregardless of programming language. One of my favorite books is uh, Java Concurrency in Practice from 2006, because it does such a good job of introducing the fundamental way to think about concurrent applications even uh, outside of Java. And they note explicitly that if you don't share state, you won't have much trouble. The approach that they propose is very similar to this one with channels, or I guess it's it's Java, so it's uh, I guess concurrent linked blocking queue or whatever. Uh, but essentially, channels as a foundational primitive for passing state between parts of the program without ever sharing it. To really emphasize this. Here's an event loop in Rust, which is mostly analogous to our Haskell one. This snippet can run in an isolated task, and the state can be kept to the specific function. We don't actually have to put it in a struct and share that around the program, or just straight up declaring it ahead of the loop and keeping it there. And in that way, we can avoid most of the problematic uh, situations that you can get into when doing concurrent programming. So let's talk about JavaScript. I have this game that I've been addicted to for 12 years or more called uh, Bubble Spinner. I tend to play this endlessly whenever I'm in a meeting or um, taking a pause to think about something. It has happened on occasion that I've been in the meeting actually presenting something, forget that I'm sharing and starts playing bubble spinner in front of the entire meeting. It's a deep rooted reflex, uh, reflective action, reflexive action for me. This was originally a flash game on some website that someone sent me. Uh, back in 2009, maybe. So I kept playing it on that site, dutifully watch watching the advertisements for years. Uh, but then it got to the point that uh, it became kind of a hassle to keep installing Flash specifically because I wanted to play this game. So I got tired of it and decided to write my own implementation of it. And by the way, the link is down here if anyone wants to actually try it. So when I was playing this game, I always had the sense that the rotation and collisions felt very intuitive. This was one of the main reasons why I worked out, worked up enough excitement about it to actually sit down and implement it, because I wanted to check if my intuition for how it worked was correct. And um, it turned out I was indeed right about it. The result that I eventually produced matched the original game um, very well. Some friends of mine even said that it felt even better than the original game. For non-physicists, there is this concept called moment of inertia, which essentially measures how difficult it is to make something revolve. It's calculated as the sum of the point masses, in this case are bubbles, that make up the object, and um, then multiplied by the distance from the axis squared. There is another quantity called angular momentum, which is the rotational ang analog of regular momentum. Interestingly, it's a conserved quantity. <laughs> And uh, it's the reason why the planets stick to their plane and uh, how gyroscopes work and so forth. We can calculate it as the cross product of the position vector times the linear and the uh, linear momentum. And 
the magnitude of the angular momentum is equivalent to angular velocity times the moment of inertia. So for this game, we want to find the change in angular velocity when you strike the frame of bubbles with the projectile. So what has all of this got to do with immutability? No, I, did. I just wanted to talk about physics for a bit. So back to programming. The physics weren't actually the most difficult part of this. Rather, by far the most complex piece was figuring out how to render the bubbles on, around the hexagon and various matters related to that. Because it turns out that the universe and the mathematics in our universe really doesn't like this arrangement. So I ended up with quite a bit of a relatively complex state. For instance, for every single bubble, there are seven separate variables here. Uh, four of them dealing exclusively with the position of the bubble within this uh, arrangement. I will spare you the nitty gritty details of this, but um, this entire game is written in um, very heavily commented uh, JavaScript in an attempt to actually make it readable. So if you're curious about the details, you can go and just view source on that page. So this is where I have to caution more sensitive programmers who may already be suffering from PTSD due to a history of intense legacy code work. There is no shame in looking away for this part. So this ended up requiring some of the trickiest conditional logic that I've ever written for any reason. Because it, as I mentioned, this doesn't have a very clean mathematical formulation. And I ended up with edge cases galore, or perhaps edge cases gore. This portion is from a method that finds all of the adjacent bubbles. I cut out about two thirds of this function to make it fit on the slide. Uh, the rest of it isn't any prettier, in addition to having a bunch of edge cases like this one down here, where the result is different for some specific value. There's this very error prone expressions for calculating uh, the adjacent uh, bubbles. Um, you can probably imagine that it took quite a long time to track down all of the bugs in this and get it uh, working reasonably well. Um, frankly, the fr frankly the adjacency search was probably the trickiest part of this game. But there were plenty of other messy situations like uh, this thing, which actually performs the search for the bubbles to remove in the event of a collision that um, just has a lot of potential for, um, for errors. But I submit to you that it isn't a mess that is the true problem. If you only have a single variable and you perform some tricky computation on it, that's Still usually highly manageable because the state space is quite small. Once you find a problem, it's trivial to trace through it in order to figure out where it goes wrong. For a program with lots of state, the state space is just so large that you may never be able to test the full state space, especially if you're also dealing with high cyclomatic complexity, which was the case here. So, how then did I ever get this working? The key trick was to make the entire game state immutable. So rather than updating the existing game state, I had the tick method return uh, an updated copy of it. And 
that was probably the thing that ended up saving this entire project because then I could just keep a sort of audit trail of all the past states before each user input. And then I wouldn't just sit down, play the game for a while. When something broke, I could open up the developer console, call a function that I had placed in there to just reset it to just before, just after that event had triggered and then step through it in the debugger. Um, I think ultimately that it ended up taking multiple weeks of on-off playing it before I had rooted out most of those uh, uh, really subtle bugs. But even to this day, my wife will sometimes complain to me when she's playing this and it randomly freezes. And, uh, I don't have uh, the patience to go track down the final few that remains in there somewhere. So, as usual, this is not a novel idea, even in the front-end world. It, the concept of immutable state in web applications and how it could help uh, seems to have really taken off some time after um, uh, React became popular, probably due to the... Uh, it pairs really well with React's emphasis on unidirectional uh, data flow. So. Here's a snippet taken from the Redux uh, state management library documentation. Immutability can bring increased performance to your app and leads to simpler programming and debugging. The final project I want to talk about is one from a long line of projects that made my wife contemplate her life choices. Sometime after we had our first child, the number of family photos had predictably grown unmanageable. She asked me if I could come up with some sort of solution so we could easily share photos at home. And naturally, my reaction was to implement a fully custom solution. I wanted an application that could run on my home server that would use the iNotify kernel API to monitor a folder for new images and automatically rescale them in the background. And that would ensure a quick and smooth experience because when you were actually loading a gallery, all the work had already been done in the background. I explained this plan to my wife, who sighed heavily and asked whether I had looked around for existing solutions for this problem. And obviously the answer was no, and I still haven't to this day. This was um, one of the earliest projects that I ever did in Rust. So I struggled a bit with the borrow checker and the restriction that mutable access is exclusive to a single uh, location in the program. The core problem was this piece that we see here, which represents a folder in the gallery. Remember that I wanted to update this in the background as uh, new changes to the file system were detected. Uh, but even when that was ongoing, I didn't want to prevent uh, clients from accessing the, the web frontend. So the easiest way to deal with this is to wrap the full thing in a lock. This works, but um, provided a lousy experience whenever we added new images in bulk, since the contag contention on the right lock ended up being significant. Intuitively, one uh, may be tempted to add a lock with, within the image gallery struct around one of these nested galleries. Unfortunately, that doesn't really help in Rust due to the use of um, uh, resource acquisition uh, is initialization uh, guards. In order to even access an inner lock, you need to take all of the outer locks as at least uh, root locks. Uh, and 
if you realize that you want to apply a change, then you have to go back up and take the uh, the right lock all the way down. So we can do much better on that if we observe that we are happy with the eventual consistency. All in directions of this structure are true uh, atomic reference counters. So the image gallery structs all live on the heap and immutable access is possible from all threads throughout the program. When something changes, we can keep the portion of the tree that didn't change, rebuild the part that did change, and then we swap out the full, the full tree. Any concurrent readers of the previous tree will still observe that. And once they are done, uh, they decrement the reference counters. And if needed, the, the unused portion of the tree gets allocated. This is essentially exactly how the tree maps that we saw earlier in Haskell works. So content with my neat solution to this problem. I lost interest in the gallery application and it remains mostly unfinished. <laughs> my wife remains annoyed. That's um, all I had today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Emil. So have you found any other way to share pictures? There are thank several. You. I think Apple kind of snuck up on us. So <laughs> okay. Discovered they solved your either. problems. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't approve this. It just sort of happened. <laughs> your wife approved it. Yeah, that's true. Okay. That's the, That's ultimately <laughs> the main thing. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, there's no questions in the chat so far. Anyone here has any questions? No. If you want to, maybe you want to build this gallery with uh, Emil. <laughs> no, no volunteers. Okay. Then thank you very much again, Emil. Thank you. Yep. And uh, thanks everyone for both the viewers online and thanks everyone for coming here. To the viewers online, goodbye. And to everyone else, please stay around, stick around, grab more beer and food until we're done. That's thanks. Then we're done. <laughs>